migrate towards environmental resolution institute at indiana university i have my colleague and very uh, close friend professor bronco from uh, uh, macedonia he is an expert on the uh, c and sia license expert institute of biology and faculty of science skopje republic of macedonia so uh, very warm welcome from my side so now i can uh, you just start your own discussion so please warm welcome from my side thank you thank you so much thank you very much uh dr branko is is the the moderator do you want to uh start the session with our colleagues yes uh <clears throat> to be honest this is my first time uh, being moderator of such um, uh, discussion panel discussion so <clears throat> well uh i think that uh it's it's uh we can just proceed as as often happens should we maybe start with some um opening thoughts from from uh, each of of uh, sir, uh professor, professor pande sir so just you sir professor pande sir are you hearing and uh, dr bhumar sir yes yes sir you can, um, you can have, moderate moderate sir patience <laughs> start for from your side sir uh may i have one request to you because uh, at 9 Uh, 20 yes, yes. i have to start the examination in the in the du okay. so i will be there but okay. some other uh, link also so i will be joining you after 9:35 okay okay sir jo, you put me put, you put just, me my discussion after 9:35 okay okay you just start yeah from, from your side sir just only 2 minutes okay okay, okay. Yes. so uh beginning with uh, the warm words the welcome words from dr bhavarsha the organizer of this meet i uh, welcome uh, on behalf of this igu and uh, on behalf of the commission of the biogeography the secretary of this commission i welcome professor john sinclair uh, he no doubt as my teacher also and uh, mentor and guide had have guided me in canada india in the kulu kulu valley i remember 1996 94 to 98 our uh, cdcc workshops and the field work professor ranko i welcome you to this commission discussion professor sharma and uh, uh, other uh, participants who are Uh, yeah professor dr devraj ji devraj singh uh professor radesh radesh sharma radesh sharma um, we are all together in this meet and uh, uh, we hope to deliver uh, with our discussion we come to the uh, concrete uh, some findings outcome of uh, the panel discussion on the ecological crisis ecological restoration and uh, ecological sustainability uh, in the biodiversity so i wish Dr. Bhavarsha? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Please go ahead. Professor John Sinclair, you can chair your session. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, Dr. Singh or Dr. Sharma, would you like to uh, uh, offer some thoughts? And I can offer some later. Um, yeah. Uh, are you addressing me? John? Yes, uh, yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I, it seems like I'm the only odd man out because I am basically a biologist um, who happened to be a lab biologist. But when I came to US, I started working with uh, 
Professor Ellen Ketterson, who is a former director of Environmental Resilience Institute. And the way Institute has a structure is uh, looking at the climate change and how it is affecting the uh, seasonal phenology and how and it can predict how the biodiversity is going to you know, shape in coming future. And uh, there are a lot of attorneys associated with uh, the Institute who you know, build policies based on the research outcomes. So it's an Institute basically working on the climate change, its effect on the biodiversity and what measures we can take to you know, uh, save our biodiversity. So uh, I don't have much experience of like field work. I'm basically a lab biologist, but uh, you know, uh, in my three years of postdoc, I have uh, gained some insight, you know, and enjoyed working in fields and, you know, studying the wild animals. Uh, at present, I'm uh, studying the uh, light at night impact on uh, biological system of the animals. So um, I did my PhD at Delhi University Department, um, where I studied the seasonal timekeeping system of animals. Right. So maybe I can uh, share my presentation. It's just a short presentation that would help me understand my research. That would be great. Um, I, I presume the screen share is turned on. Yeah, I think I, think I can try from... Uh, okay. Yep, Do you see the yep. presentation? Oh, yep. cool. Okay. All right, it's so... I think I'll just finish in 10 minutes. I won't take long. <laughs> um, no, all right, so I've been on artificial light impact on uh, the biodiversity. So I included biodiversity here for you know the forum, but I work on Daikai Junko. I'm an ornithologist. I work on bird uh, species. Um, oh. So we work on Daikai Junkos and probably if uh, you are in Canada, you might have seen Daikai Junkos. They're commonly known as snowbirds. Yeah. Uh, in Canada as well, uh, because they're the migrants and they migrate to Canada and northern parts of Alaska. So I'm associated with the Department of Biology, Indiana University, and also Environmental Resilience Institute. So I work on the seasonal time system. So we have to understand the, uh, so I know most of the people that are concerned about the physical world in geography but I think uh, it doesn't make sense uh, unless we integrate biology with, you know, the living system in that geographical world. So the most consistent pattern we see in the geographical world is Earth rotating around the sun or revolving around the sun. And that generates the daily timekeeping system and seasonal timekeeping system. Um, so the Earth's rotation on its own axis generates the day and night alteration that we see every day. It's pretty consistent. Um, since uh, the life has originated and revolution around the sun creates the season. So one of the uh, important uh, phenomenon for uh, seasonal animals is to be in synchrony with this, you know, changing timing, you know, so that they can anticipate their life history states and daily activities. If they, anything happens that perturbs their biological timekeeping system, <laughs> might affect the population and eventually the biodiversity. So this is a brief introduction of how a life history state of bird look like. So there are birds, they just reproduce uh, seasonally and there are birds, they also migrate. They have an additional life history state called migration in their uh, uh, seasonal system. So the birds, they breed, they lay eggs. These eggs, they hatch, they molt, they shed their feathers. And then, you know, they show spring and autumn migration. And you might have heard geese migrating, you know, this is the time when they show winter migration. And uh, if you look at your backyard, you will see a lot of birds that you have never seen, you know, in other season. And this is just because, you know, they're migrating back. Um, and as summer approaches, you will see these birds building nest and laying eggs, you know, uh, near your house. So since my focus is on uh, artificial light at night, so the reason why uh, I'm more interested by at night because one of the important and more um, reliable cue these animals they sense is the change in day length that drives the seasonal changes. So the transition <clears throat> from short day to long day 
help them, uh, you know, sensing the time of the season and time their life history state. So what we humans are doing, we are encroaching the land and then we are, you know, building, you know, buildings, we are building industries and they all have artificial lights. And these artificial lights kind of like mislead these seasonal animals because they just, they're used to uh, getting cue of day and night. So day is important, but night is also important. But with artificial light at night, what we're doing, we are confusing them. And this- Good led morning, Batu. Uh, Good, Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. So, uh, Mr. it's 921. Mr. Pandy, uh, you, need to, you need to put your uh, microphone on mute. Sorry, Dr. Singh. No, that's okay. It's totally fine. So yeah, this picture I got from um, uh, a news uh, paper, the Environmental Health Perspective, uh, that predicted, you know, how the North American map is going to look like if this uh, the building and artificial light, uh, you know, goes on. So if you look at 1950. They were barely, you know, you can see lights at night in North America. And as time passes, you can see the whole land is occupied by, you know, buildings and the cities are building. The new land is encroached by humans. And you can see the effect. You can see that now there's no more night, uh, the real night, they are light at night. So there's light pollution, uh, which is kind of like elevating as time passing. Uh, this is how, uh, a uh, street nearby looks like uh, where I live. I live in Bloomington, Indiana. And this is how, so usually um, it's pretty dark, but sometimes in summer you will see, you know, street lights, um, uh, you know, close to the highways. Um, and these birds, they just house nearby. So they get, you know, these, they get exposed to these artificial lights and that affects their seasonal system. Uh, before coming to my research work, I also want to show that, uh, I want to tell you that how the other uh, biological uh, animals, they're affected. So this is an example, the turtle hatchlings, they uh, were coming to the roadside because once they hatch, they follow the bright light at the horizon. But because there is a lot more intense light at the roadway side, they were disoriented and they're moving towards road. And that is how you know, they encounter, you know, uh, accidents, you know, uh, by car and other uh, vehicles. And, you know, that is how we're losing the biodiversity. So I work on uh, uh, dark eye junco uh, system, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this is the annual geographical variation in the seasonal reproduction of dark eye junco. This is the North American map. Um, so, these, this is how they look like. The, so they have like migrant and resident populations. Um, they show sympatry uh, during early spring in Virginia and northern, uh, southern parts of America. So we have a bending station, a field station at uh, Mountain Lake uh, Bending Station at Virginia, where we visit. I recently came from field uh, work. Um, so we just go there to catch these birds and study their system. Um, so the migrants, they have pink bill and the residents, they have a bluish bill. So they are the same population. There is no uh, divergence at the species level. So they're still not called species, they're subpopulations. Uh, but the migrants, they show migratory pattern every year. So they all winter in you know Southern part, but once they have to breed, they breed to the northern parts of Canada or Alaska. That's their breeding ground. And the uh, middle US and eastern US is their uh, wintering ground. Whereas the uh, resident population, they breed over there year round. So they don't migrate, they are sedentary birds. So for us, the interesting question is, uh, these the sedentary birds, because they live year round there, they start breeding earlier. Whereas the migrants, because they have to first migrate and then breed, so they delay their breeding. So for us, the interesting question is, this, if the light is the cue for you know, reproduction, 
why there is a difference in the timing of reproduction. So that's our biological question. <laughs> but I'll talk more about the integration of you know, geography and ecosystem. Um, so to know uh, from where they're migrating, we, have, uh, we are using a tool using a hydrogen isotope from their feathers. So these animals, they are seasonal breeders. Once they breed, they terminate their breeding and they shed their old feather and they grow their new feather. So once they grow their new feather, um, as you're aware, there's a gradient of precipitation of hydrogen isotope because of you know, uh, different geographical patterns and difference in the rainfall across the North America. So if the birds uh, that breed at Alaska and molt at Alaska grow their feathers from Alaska, they drink water from the Alaska and they incorporate those signatures you know, in the feather. And once they come to you know, lower latitude, we just plug their feather and measure hydrogen isotope. And then looking at the ratio of the hydrogen isotope, we can predict where this bird was you know, breeding. So that's a tool we are using to differentiate the latitude and climb. Uh, this is a recent paper that we published that shows, um, so we got birds from uh, mountain lake and the, the, uh, we got migrants and residents, all birds. Uh, we plugged their feather and we found there was a huge uh, difference in the latitude. If you see that bar graph, the migrants, they have lighter hydrogen isotope and that means they are from high latitude. The residents, they have heavier hydrogen isotope and that means they are from lower latitude. Um, and this is based on the precipitation gradients across the US. Um, um, and then we studied the biology and we found that the birds with, uh, we found a nice correlation that the birds with heavier hydrogen isotope uh, were breeding earlier than lighter hydrogen isotopes. And that kind of like confirmed that migrants, they delay their breeding. Uh, after learning the difference in the seasonal timekeeping system, I thought uh, because the migrant, there are several reports that migratory birds, they uh, fly, you know, uh, they, they travel a long distance and they get exposed to different cities, you know, and there are reports that, you know, uh, different, they get striked to different buildings, you know, because uh, once they see these illuminations, you know, they lose their cognition and they get disoriented and they get trapped in that light. And there are a lot of uh, reports that, you know, in cities uh, nowadays, people are finding a lot of dead birds because of the window striking and, you know, other things. So I thought, um, let's study the impact of light at night uh, in lab, how the reproduction and other systems get affected. So last year we did this experiment. So as you see, this is how the night looks like nowadays. Um, you know, it's illuminated. You don't see dark patch anywhere. So this is showing the seasonal reproduction, how it looks like, you know, they are non-reproductive in short days, small gonads. Uh, they reproduce in, as they start seeing long days. Um, so the problem is because they migrate uh, during winter here and in their migratory passage, if they see uh, lights, they will get a, information that, oh, probably it's a long day, which is not true. It's short day, it's just the effect of artificial light at night, which tells their system, you know, that there's extended day length, which is just because of the artificial light at night. So we found that uh, if you expose them to artificial light at night, uh, everything gets advanced. And that, uh, that matches with our prediction that this uh, artificial light at night uh, gives them a false indication that they are getting long days, which is not true. And they started accelerating uh, their reproductive processes. Uh, we also measure the migratory activity. So we put loggers on these birds and basically we record their locomotor activity. Um, and you can see nighttime activity, uh, migratory activity in lab as well. So this is the locomotor activity. If you look at the bouts, they tell, they tell you the, um, number of hours they have uh, locomoted, like they have shown the locomotion. Um, so these bouts show that this is daytime. These are diurnal animals. So you can see activity at daytime, but night you don't see anything, you know, because they're diurnal. But these birds, they migrate at night. So this ectogram is showing uh, the strong um, consolidated bout. That means they're in migratory activity. 
this group was not exposed to light at night. They had dark night, so you don't see night activity here. But this group uh, had uh, in the similar day length, but with uh, dim light at night showed night activity earlier. That means it's not just a reproduction, but the migratory activity is also induced earlier because of the light at night. So in the lab, we explained it's not just a reproduction, but the migratory process is also advanced. And this is a, one of the deleterious effect of light at night because everything is linked. These birds, they need uh, insects uh, one, once they breed because they have to feed high fat and protein rich diet to the growing hatchlings. So uh, if they migrate early, reach to breeding ground early, and start breeding early, then they don't get those uh, nutritious elements to feed the young ones. And this would affect the biodiversity and population in general. This is an interesting paper came out, which showed that, so in US after 9-11, they installed a tribute in light uh, in New York, which is in tribute of those who lost their life, you know, in that incident. Um, so there was a report that, you know, they found almost 15,700 uh, birds trapped in that light source. It's a heavy light source, you know, uh, during that uh, tribute of light. This paper was published in PNS and this shows clear effect of like, you know, light at night illumination, how the birds get trapped, you know, in artificial lights in big cities. Um, so yeah, that's what uh, I'm doing. It's basically more biology, but you know, in general talking about uh, ecosystem and uh, biodiversity. So I would like to thank Professor Alan Ketterson, who is my mentor. Craig Stryker is our uh, um, collaborator who does the hydrogen iso isotope stuff. Um, Adam Fudiker is a research fellow at Environmental Resilience Institute and rest of the people are my collaborators and lab mates. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to have your questions <laughs> if you have any. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Singh. Appreciate your talk very much. I, I don't know if you know my colleague, uh, Nicola Coper. She does work uh, on, uh, on uh, a lot of work on her lab is, is devoted to doing work on birds as well. Um, a lot of their work is related to noise. Interesting. I've read a couple of papers, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's, that's, uh, it's very interesting um, work. I, I, you know, I've been so focused over the years on her work on noise. I, I certainly know about the increased light, but I never thought about uh, the impact on birds. The one image that you showed, um, that showed the activity at night. I'm wondering, uh, is there work going on that that looks at the impact of that? That they're not resting, not just the reproductive, but their general health impact. Yeah. So there are a lot of uh, studies that uh, it, it 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 affects different things. So even in the humans, you know, uh, we gain we gain weight because of the light at night, you know, shift workers, they are prone to several diseases, illness and weight gain. Um, also, um, light at night affects your <clears throat> cognitive ability. If you've not slept well, you won't have a good uh, alertness and cognitive ability, you know, in the morning time. So it affects the other things as well. So, so yeah, it affects the whole system, you know, in different ways in general. We are also interested in uh, uh, studying the effect of uh, temperature the as a climate change in the seasonal phenology of these birds so you know apart from so we are testing different things so light was the primary cue that we have tested and we have right. seen that it affects now we are coming to the temperature these are called supplementary cues temperature food noise and you know um, very, other things very interesting uh, dr sharma do you have any questions yeah, and it's very interesting work, uh, Dr. Singh. I enjoyed your uh, talk and your presentation. I think I'll read more about your paper. And uh, But at the same time, you know, see, I agree with you that how the behavioral ecology changes because of uh, this, uh, I mean, light as a factor. Okay. So I, I, I'm, I'm just curious that whether these, uh, I mean, uh, this has uh, impacted on the population dynamics of some of these because... I know that the mating behavior and reproduction pattern is changing. 
and then, so is there any quantification on population dynamics how it is a change over a period of time and this yeah. is very interesting yeah yeah so there are papers um available um they talk about more on population levels so there was one paper uh, published recently they were studying the cleveland ohio cities and they found like you know different uh, species of uh, birds because it was from a bird lab they found like you know different species of birds uh, in those uh, uh, high intense illuminated uh, cities there were more uh, you know species uh, of birds they were like you know dying they found like you know characters of those birds and there are you know studies at population level as well so they have um, basically predicted and there was a recent uh, news that you know we lost 30000 bird species you know in 30 years so what else we we want to know like you know this this, this could be one of the factor affecting uh, because we have seen how from 1950 to today the light at night has changed you know in north america so i think um, yeah that was a big news that we lost 30000 species in north america yeah, very interesting. And uh, as a biologist, I'll be curious, I mean, uh, whether you could see any kind of adaptation because see, in the change in light pattern, I mean, over a period of time, yes. and, uh, uh, I'm sure that it has a detrimental effect and your study also shows and, and other studies which you have mentioned. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm confident and, and I believe that, yes, it has a major impact on uh, the ecology of birds and biodiversity. But have you seen any kind of new adaptation? Because that that will also, I mean, tell us that how the evolution is happening. I mean, over a period of time, in, and it has been restricted in a, such a small period, which right. I think you have mentioned. Yeah. That's a very interesting uh, question, and uh, I think it is more about the plasticity in the system. So, if the animal has a plastic system, uh, then you know it will tend to um, adapt. If it is, it has a rigid system. Um, you know, it won't adapt. For example, uh, we are studying the resident and migration, uh, sp migratory species. The resident species, they have a longer duration of reproduction. So they have enough time to adjust. But migratory species, they have to migrate. They just have like two months to breed. If anything happens in between and they pass that time, they won't breed that year. So I think uh, there are studies but not related to light at night, but related to temperature. Uh, I remember I was in a meeting, I remember a talk where uh, one of these species, someone mentioned that because of the harsh winter, uh, that species did not breed that year because, you know, they cannot, uh, you know, get nutrition and they cannot raise the hatchlings. So they did not, they chose not to breed that year. So definitely, you know, it affects the uh, system, but some species they do adapt, but some species they don't. So it also, also depends on the plasticity of the system of a species. My last small query, I mean, if the chair permits. Of See, uh, uh, I know, I mean, uh, your observation is very, very interesting and very critical. I mean, uh, for a biodiversity expert, and I think we'll be now using your resource material for teaching our scholars as well. So that they'll be motivated to undertake some such kind of work. But see, like in, I know some of my colleagues who are working on migratory birds and then we are also working on some ecosystem restoration. So what we have found is, I mean, many a times these birds find alternative habitats, okay? Because under stress, okay, then uh, rather than migrate, they change the migration pattern and they look for the alternative habitats and uh, to reside. So did you find some kind of, I mean, in the, some in the patterns where they have found some suitable, you know, see everybody has to survive and biology has given inherent capacity. Yeah. To, yeah. So do you find question. Uh, I personally do not do uh, much field work. I'm more restricted to lab work and like doing manipulating system in the lab and seeing effect. But I have colleagues, they work on a geolocator system. They put geolocators on the birds, they track the birds. So the Environmental Resilience Institute, uh, there is a research fellow, Alex Jan. Uh, he does all this stuff. Um, so coming to that, um, when we say that, you know, the population change moved a bit, you know, just to adopt and have a favorable system, you know, uh, for their generation, uh, I think, in research, we have lacked the uh, several ways of, you know, verifying that. So, for example, we study in lab and we use hydrogen isotope and other things to predict, but that is not that accurate, you know. 
if you put the geolocator system with that, you would able to, you know, establish that, oh, this bird was breeding there, you know, geolocator system confirmed that. So I think uh, we need several approaches to confirm that if a bird changed its site is uh, because to adopt or like, you know, there are partial migrants. Sometimes they just, you know, move to different locations. So, so those are things we have to consider but I do agree, like, you know, they do move to other locations, favorable locations to, you know, adopt better and do better for the next generation. So, yeah, thank you. Well, that's Yeah, I enjoyed your presentation once again. Thank you. Yes, yes thank you very much, uh, Dr. Singh. I, I just before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge my colleague that's joined us, Dr. R.B. Singh. Dr. Singh, namaste, sir. I haven't seen Dr. Singh in a long time, so it's very nice to see you, Dr. Thank Singh. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, welcome, Professor Sinclair. I think you have a spare time. I think we are very grateful. Yeah. And con <laughs> congratulations yeah. to the all colleagues for yeah. this session. It is a very interesting, you know, discussion. Very good. Namaskar. Good morning, sir. Very good morning. Namaskar, Professor Sarma ji. Welcome. Namaskar. Very good. Nice to see you, sir. Namaskar, sir. We, we, Namaskar, uh, Pandeji, uh, Dr. Singh, congratulations. Congratulations. Thank very, you. very good. I've heard, about, I've heard about you many times from uh, Dr. Bauer, but I never get a chance to meet you. But good to see you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so kind of. Yeah, Dr. R.B. Singh is well known around the world. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> you know, today is yeah, another meeting also in Japan and on India. So I have to attend that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no worry. It's very good to see you, though, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sharma, would you like to offer some thoughts, please? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor John. See, the interesting thing is, I mean, I'm very happy to see, first of all, the theme of the, um, I mean, international conference, it's very well chosen. Let me be very frank. I must appreciate that uh, global to local sustainability. See, ultimately, in, in the key lies here, that how the, in the locally we can connect to the global level and how the, the local technologies, low technologies, which are very well adapted to those areas, and they can contribute to the sustainability. And so that we can make some changes at the local level and make the connection at the global scale. So I think that this, uh, this conference at the right time when in 2021 and 2030 is a decade of UN, UN decade of ecosystem restoration. So I think it's a, this uh, international conference will have a major impact on the next coming decades and probably several decades. So the kind of the discussion which is happening, I think this will make a some kind of resolutions both at the national and global level so i look forward for such kind of ideas from this conference and what we do in university see our area is more on ecosystem restoration how we can restore the degraded and contaminated ecosystems to make the area sustainable and here again the role of biology comes because the locally adapted species because each ecosystem vary in different species so we focus on the what say the native species uh, rather than to make the area green and just uh, do the afforestation program we focus on the principle of restoration ecology and how um, we can restore those degraded and contaminated ecosystems by understanding the biological interactions between some of the wild plants wild plants which are native to those area so generally we focus on uh, some of the legumes and uh, wild grasses and because they are the pioneer species in restoring and uh, processing the habitat. And uh, we focus on the plant microbe interactions in the grasses and the wild legumes and their the microbial communities, which are present from the reference ecosystem, which are uh, from uh, which are available in those some pristine patches which are available. So we analyze those um, biological interactions and identify the right biological material so that we can uh, introduce into the degraded and contaminated ecosystem. So this is in brief, I mean, but although you know, there's a lot of biology and ecology is involved in choosing those uh, systems, but uh, and you'll be very happy to know that we have demonstrated this technology works. And we introduce in some of the degraded ecosystem, the technology and, um, and there is a center, a separate center on this in our university center for environmental management of degraded ecosystems. 
we are dedicatedly working on restoring the degraded lands throughout the india and uh, we have successfully demonstrated and that this technology works and uh, the go many uh, government agencies they have been uh, they have constituted a task force uh, of those uh, army people to restore those degraded ecosystems so that we can transfer this technology because ultimately the role of scientist is the technology works in the field we can demonstrate and then know how we can transfer to the stakeholder whether it is mining industry or whether it is a forest and forestry in a forest department and so on so we work more on the, the what is both fundamental science as well as the and application of those science specifically for restoring the ecosystem and there are many success stories and i think whenever comes next time and all of you i invite in delhi so we we can take you to those sites where the restoration has happened and that is in the reality so focus is to analyze the fine biological interactions between those and i'll give just one example although right now we are meeting because of covid 19 virus and which is a major threat but in at the same time virus is very useful okay they have shaped our genome okay most of the i mean in the, the genome which we carry the, the genes have come from uh, viruses so similarly in the ecosystem we have uh, we have many viruses which help these microbes to survive because Now that that is our new idea which we are proposing in improving the restoration technology because bacteria is a host for virus if bacteria dies then virus will also die so in in adverse ecosystems in stress ecosystems these viruses come for rescue to the bacterial host so they transfer certain genes so that their bacterial host can survive okay and when the bacterial host increase in number then they become lytic and increase their population so such kind of dynamics are happening in environment okay so we want to identify those viruses which help these bacteria microbes to survive because ultimately in restoration technology the microbes play a very significant role in survival of those in the wild plants and, and once we know this dynamics because it is we, we have not done anything in nature it is happening so we want to learn about these dynamics how these viruses are helping the microbe to survive because there is a major threat in you know any technology in not only in ecological restoration wherever we use bacterial technology viruses are coming as a threat they changes the behavior of those bacteria and so on so we are under, we are trying to understand the then in nature what kind of interactions and the relationship which is happening between those bacteria and viruses so that we can make use of those relationship because that will make the microbial technology or ecological restoration technology more sustainable so the idea is we are focusing more on fundamental questions as well and how these microbial communities function how the microbes help the plants to survive and then at the same time using this idea to go to the field and so that we can plant translate and transform these degraded ecosystems or contaminated ecosystems and to make it more biologically productive not only green because that the, the lost communities of plants animals insects should re restore back because ultimately those ecosystems provide you know, those uh, goods and services which we are looking for for sustainability and we, we now we know that more than 145 trillion us dollar benefits which we get from these ecosystems now here we focus on as an economist we focus on economic indicators they are important for sustainability but in in, in countries like india and many different countries we do need strong health indicators environmental indicators and social indicators because ultimately the economic indicators are not enough for sustainability so now this ecosystem restoration can play a significant role in improving and contributing to sustainability because here not only economic indicators will look for the environmental health and social indicator as well because the social equity and then the, the environmental safety and environmental indicators are also equally important so that's how the i believe that restoration ecology has a key to restore yeah and uh, to practice or convert the idea of sustainability into practice so this is one idea which we where we focus on and at the same time we are also focusing on some to make the some of the industries sustainable and uh, the industries where uh, you know the uh, fastest growing economy like india so they, they are being challenged by the environmental pollution because of industrial waste water so we focus on the biodiversity of those areas how it is being affected because of industrial waste water and how we can make this wastewater treatment more sustainable again the principle lies in the microbial ecology and the understanding the microbial interactions 
and how these microbes can also help in those industries to make the wastewater treatment sustainable because ultimately challenge lies in the cost effectiveness in those industries as well as the efficacy and we are also highlighting some of the policy issues where the the government is um, for example in many industries we are focusing on uh, certain parameters for wastewater treatment but we we know there are hidden threats in ecology from those industries and we have demonstrated that some of the, those molecules which are passed through the laws globally not only in india globally they are being considered safe but when they reach to the environment they become more toxic so that means the fate of the those toxicants should also be considered while uh, governing the policies so this is another area where where the sustainability lies that we need to look for the holistic approach because the parent compounds may remain safe but ultimately their byproducts in the environment which are formed in the environment because of biological interactions they are not safe so this is another idea where we collaborate with um, university college london or university exeter ma massachusetts institute of technology and uh, we have australian collaboration so we so we are, we are the like minded people who are focusing on these that how we can exchange our ideas and expertise and to make this area sustainable and another aspect where we we focused on earlier that how these ecosystems provide um, benefit to the society because ultimately the policy the policy makers they are also under stress in in especially not only probably in india as well as outside india as well the policy makers have a different kind of pressures because they have to demonstrate that how they are helping the society for employment generation or for revenue generation and so on but here as a student of ecology i'm a student of ecology so how the ec ecological sustainability can also be considered but the, the challenge is economic ecological sustainability is the future okay employment generation revenue, revenue generation is the present so how we how we can convince the policy maker that you wait for such kind of in, in development should not happen and because we are going to get some kind of benefit in a long term so we collaborated with economists where we did the ecological economics of certain ecosystem where the government was interested in uh, for revenue generation and then when we do the did the cost benefit analysis how those ecosystems are providing benefit to the society and scenario building the 10 years 20 years and 30 years time what kind of benefit the society will get so and if we do the what is it the development then 10 years 20 years and 30 years time what kind of benefit which we are, we are going to get from those developmental scenario and once we did the the cost benefit analysis and demonstrated that leaving those areas like flood plains of yamuna that without development is more beneficial than doing some kind of developmental activities and government was convinced so that means in the the, uh, the collaboration with in the, a multidisciplinary approach because our aim is same whether we are in geography or economist or pure biologist or ecologist or social scientist aim is same that sustainable development sustainability good quality of life so the, in the now this in the beyond the silos i think that's the key for sustainability which i believe and we have also experienced this although there is there are challenges because we are not trained in i mean for the, uh, breaking the barriers but i think this is the time when i request that uh, I, i think this uh, combination of um, this gathering in the panel itself shows that we, now here we have pure biologist who is working on ecology uh, behavioral ecology and how the uh, it changes and there are people who are working on biogeography and uh, some very good questions on geographical science and then we have uh, ecologist and we have bird and then the ecologist and then we have resilience so i think that kind of interaction will make a difference so i i believe that uh, ecosystem restoration and the restoration ecology is the key for sustainability we need to adopt and we need to focus on in uh, degraded ecosystems and contaminated ecosystems in across the let you tell mother earth and i think this decade is the test for us because the un has announced this uh, decade as a ecosystem restoration so it's a test on all of us that how we can join together and how we can develop those ideas where we can help each other and uh, demonstrate then in our area local to global sustain the theme which in the theme of this conference i think will be will we can justify it very well so let's see i mean i'll be very happy when uh, i mean if you have any question and queries and uh, and if you have some suggestions in fact they are most welcome because i am already biased with my views let me so yes. uh, yeah, your uh, your inputs will make a difference and that will guide me for uh, improving and in, uh, integrating your suggestions thank you
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, I, I just a quick comment. I would say, you know, we have some more practical examples now of, of what you're describing. Um, a colleague of mine now, uh, our new dean, actually, he's working with what he calls green liver systems. So he's creating uh, green livers to uh, deal with contaminated water, um, using biological systems to, to purify water. And um, uh, these systems range from a small community level to um, an industry or a new development, for example. Uh, so yeah, it's very interesting. And it does create biodiversity as well. So uh, questions, any questions uh, for Dr. Sharma? Thoughts? Well, uh, I have a question. So first of all, thank you very much for you know, sharing your thoughts. Uh, it's really interesting, uh, Dr. Sharma. Um, so do you also uh, study the invasive, non-invasive plant species? Because um, we have a colleague who is also associated to our Environmental Resilience Institute. She does, you know, invasive, non-invasive studies, although we don't have here much, you know, um, uh, and they also study the pollutants effect on biodiversity, whether it is flora or fauna uh, across the North America. So my question is, um, um, do you study first invasive non-invasive species? And if there is any study that shows that the invasive species, they are more resistant, they have some kind of microbial cluster that makes them more resistant and, you know, they spread and, you know, they occupy the land and, you know, uh, separate out the um, non-invasive species or the local species. Um, if you can share your thoughts. Yeah. yeah, that's a very interesting question. Let me tell you, it's a challenge. I mean, the invasive species are the major threats in the global level to biodiversity. Uh, I, I'm, so even in Delhi and in India, and there are certain species which are invasive, I think you can rate them in the top 10 uh, invasive species globally. So one of them is Prosopis juliflora. So uh, yes, I, we do study. Um, we focus on uh, yes uh, on uh, native and uh, non-native or uh, invasive species as well. See, the idea is that I'll I think I'll make two comments on here two, uh, of different types, and it will give different ideas about uh, what do you say invasive species. In what in in our experience, we found that invasive species have a different cluster of microorganisms. Because there are many theories and hypotheses that how these invasive species are invasive. Okay, so they, because they modify the soil and they control the soil habitats by releasing certain chemicals and so on. And another idea is that they do modify the microbial communities in their vicinity. Okay, and they promote some of those, what do you say, the like attracts the like. So they, they also attract some of the microbes which are more aggressive in nutrient acquisition. Okay, and they deprive the others because, for example, what we found is there are some of these microbes which are present in their uh, root zone of these um, non-native species. They are uh, sidrophore producers, and the sidrophores are those uh, iron chelating molecules which can which are which can chelate the uh, chelate the iron from uh, in the environment very quickly, and they are very aggressive. Okay, unlike uh, the what do you say the native species. So the, the, it is likely that they have been modifying it and uh, attracting different kind of microbes in their root zone, no doubt. And to control those, uh, nay, again, invasive species, many ideas are there at the global level available. But what we found is whenever system is like, I mean, if, if you look at the economic system or any other system where there is some uh, challenges in the system, only then the different forces, the market forces, and I mean, they, they monopolize uh, your, uh, your market. Similarly, in a, this in a, in a, what is say invasive species whenever there is a, a an ecosystem is degraded or then it, they become vulnerable to invasive species otherwise those ecosystems they have a resilience not only to restore back their ability but they can prevent the, these invasive species so in this case again the restoration ecology when you you identify the right cluster of those native plants which used to exist in those areas locally because the biology is local if you look at very carefully, it's local, and but it has a global impact. So if you identify those right uh, assemblage of species which are of local ecosystem and introduce in a phase manner, they can re really remove and uh, prevent the expansion of those, uh, what is say, invasive species. This is what our experience is. And another thing, 
in, in many countries like India, which are fastest growing, but they have, I mean, many other challenges in, in the society to take care of. So uh, we are not able to spend so much money, which many developed countries have spent on controlling invasive species in the past. And if you look at, um, I mean, the success rate is very low. Okay, in, in those even developed countries to control the invasive species in, in spite of spending the billions of dollars. And we, what we have proposed is based on our research and there are a couple of papers that these invasive species do have some in, uh, biological enzyme system. Okay, in not only modifying the root, but they do have some enzyme system in their leaf and root. Okay, which, which make them more adaptable to those stress and degraded environment and they can monopolize. So what we have done is we have identified some of these in the, what is the enzyme system and uh, from those uh, invasive species and those and en those uh, enzyme can be used to treat the wastewater so that means and now these invasive species are already available throughout there are surplus available in, in the different parts of the world and even in india so manage these species by use this is another principle which in fact un has also suggested that we must look for the managing these species by use so that there is a control there is a check on population expansion of those uh, invasive species, but how to use, okay, not by just cutting and fodder and fuel, because cut many times cutting and pollarding, you know it as a, a student of biology, it, it increased the expansion also. So now what we have uh, suggested is based on our um, publication that they say these prosopis juliflora do have certain, uh, what do you say, peroxidase enzyme, which can be useful for um, uh, wastewater treatment. So uh, we have demonstrated how it can be used and how it is efficient for many commercially available enzyme. So uh, that means uh, we need to understand the, how the biology, how they are modifying the soil and how we can control by uh, introducing the cluster of native species and how we can manage these non-native by using them uh, for different purposes so that we can solve um, the local problems by using the another local problem. Okay, so I think these are the different ideas which we are working on, but we, we are taking care of these uh, <coughs> invasive species. It's a big challenge, I agree with you. Interesting, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we should move on, our time is already running and uh, I think uh, Dr. Pandey and I both have a few words. So Dr. Pandey, did you wanna share a few words and then- uh, Yes, sir. So, uh, uh, I will finish within five for less than 10 minutes. Is it okay? 10 minutes? Uh, well, yeah, sure. 10 and then I'll take Thank 10 you, and we'll be done. So go ahead. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, all ten, though, Dr. Pandy. Yeah. And uh, first of all, is it audible? Yeah, I think so. So, First of all, beginning with the, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sarma, uh, such interesting uh, ecological restoration. We are on the same boat. Um, I'm also working on uh, uh, climate change and uh, ecological crisis in Himalaya, and also going for the uh, working on ecological restoration uh, re-strengthening the natural environment in the high altitude region of Himalaya. And in the beginning, uh, my training started with, uh, right, Professor R.B. Singh, Professor Jim Gardner, Professor John Sinclair, during my uh, research as a PhD student in Kulu Valley, and then moved from uh, Himachal Pradesh to Uttarakhand, then uh, Rajal Pradesh, then Jammu Kashmir, so now uh, I'm working on Thang to Tawang across the 2,900 kilometers from Thang village border to Pakistan to the Tawang region border to China in the east. And uh, a number of empirical evidences I'd like to share with that there are uh, number of issues which are emerging with climate change and ecological crisis coming up. So 
uh, is this visible? The my screen is visible. Yes, yes, it is visible, Professor Pandey. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, how the climate change creating ecological crisis, and uh, uh, definitely, definitely, the climate change over the mountain region is more vulnerable, more exposed, creating a number of risk and vulnerabilities as compared to the plain region. Because mountain region itself fragile in the nature. And any, any change in the mountain uh, temperature, rainfall, creating a lot of ecological crisis, which I'm going to deal with you. And, uh, and the third pole, the highest water tower of the world, the Asia, sustaining the Asian river basin civilization, draining over more than thousands of the rivers in a, in a century fugal pattern, ranging from the Tarim Basin to Sangpo Basin, Indus Basin, Indo Ganga, Indo -Ganga Plain, Mekong, Iraudi, Chindwin, Salwin, and uh, all these uh, almost 50% of the global population surviving through the uh, resources of the highland of Himalaya. So this highland resource sustaining the lowland civilization. And now the present study which I had conducted from 1978 to 2018 data, this is the rainfall, precipitation and temperature data of Chamba district Himachal Pradesh, one of the example, one of the examples over the last 40 years, over the last 40 years, the trend of the precipitation, trend of the precipitation after 1988, it is continuous declining. Continuous declining over the last 24 years, the continuous decrease in the nature and pattern of the rainfall. Similarly, similarly, if you look this diagram, the relationship between the rainfall and the temperature. Rainfall and temperature. So over the, over the last 40 years data of 1978 to 2018, it shows that the after 94, 95, the precipitation is decreasing continuously and the average temperature, average mean temperature, Average low temperature means maximum temperature, minimum temperature, average temperature, all are increasing continuously over 91, 92. So now the duration between 94 to 98, the average temperature, average precipitation, which were parallel, now from the parallel, the direction has become different direction and the maximum gap the this anomaly this this these changes creating lot of extra energy to adopt so climate change adaptation both in flora and fauna also the mountain society mountain community and these changes these changes are creating creating a negative impact on the opportunities, livelihood options, livelihood security of the local community, and particularly, particularly the transhumans community. The transhumans community are being affected because the land use, land cover change due to climate change. The pasture land, grazing land, reducing. The pasture land being converted into agricultural land. Lot of horticulture, vegiculture, floriculture, emerging and the open land, thatches, grazing land are reducing in size. Again, again, this is the empirical evidence that the Meadows, 
say 20 years back 30 years back these areas were pure meadows for grazing and now there is a thousands of hectares of the plantation of apple tree so apple production has increased from a height of 1800 meter to 2800 meter and 2800 meter was grazing land pasture land meadows earlier now converted as the apple orchards similarly similarly number of spring shed ecology we have concluded we have conducted individual spring shed thousands of the spring shed in uttarakhand and himachal pradesh have dried up their natural source natural source of water is drying and because of this the livelihood livelihood of the people are being affected now they are carrying water transporting water water was draining at doorstep earlier households on this mountain slope were built up along the source of a spring so those springs have dried up and because of the springs are being drying up people are forced people are forced to migrate people are forced to migrate this is the recent newspaper cutting from uttarakhand the 35 households left out their villages due to water crisis their spring dried up and this picture shows that when the after the wedding the newly wedded couple come to the household before entering in the house they go to the pandhara poojan dhara poojan to worship the spring because a spring is the ultimate source of water village livelihood village society all are connected with the pandhara with the spring a perennial source of water for the survival of the people of that particular village so so the water a drawing up and covering from uttarakhand up to leh and you must have must have seen this this uh, fiang village fiang village of the leh valley where norfell norfell first of all norfell postulated the concept of the artificial glacier then later on the sonam wangchuk who is working in the fiang village and creating the artificial glacier this is one of the best example of climate change adaptation climate change adaptation artificial glacier and these artificial glacier gradually melt down in the spring and summer and drain in the lower basin and the sustain agriculture so this is the this is the example a very famous movie three idiots three idiots movie so when the sonam wangchuk started the large scale artificial glacier these artificial glaciers are now feeding water in the bottom of the leh and the fiang village surrounding villages through this artificial glacier during the summer and spring season lot of water available through the rivulets through the cools and now the city which was dry city now has become the green city these artificial glacier are feeding the household to the to the horticulture and uh, floriculture in across the himalaya and the trans himalaya and sir i would like to introduce the um, professor dr sharma professor sharma my, my colleague of the environmental studies department so ecological restoration sir similar work we are doing also with the with the support of the local people we have some local heroes local champions which i would like to introduce the dr sachidanand bharti dr sachidanand bharti ufrekhal ufrekhal 
रीजन ऑफ द गढ़वाल हिमालय पानी राखो आंदोलन के प्रणेता सच्चिदानंद भारती को डॉक्टर ऑस्ट्रोलिया अवार्ड एंड सच्चिदानंद भारती सच्चिदानंद भारती हु हैज हु हैज क्रिएटेड रीजेनरेटेड रीजुवेनेटेड ए ड्राई स्प्रिंग and now that is spring the village people were migrating now they have come back settled the village and the plenty of water is available so local people call them bhagirath of modern india bhagirath of modern india kuri generated the dhar ganga the spring is now named as dhar ganga similarly similarly in chamoli district chamoli district of uttarakhand in the only village the chamoli district where the ex soldier single handedly transformed a wasteland into lush forest in uttarakhand back in 1973 it was a patch of barren land strewn with rocks today it is a thriving 1.5 hectare agro forest thanks to an incredible effort by ex soldier jagat singh now he had created jungle so now his nickname is jangli jagat singh choudhary now called jagat singh jangli and here is choudhary jagat singh jangli who had created the concept of forest agro agriculture in the forest dr. so uh, dr pandey yes uh, sir You've used about 15 minutes, so uh, if you could wrap okay, up. Okay, now going to close. Yeah, now going to close, sir. Just one and a half minute. So just a picture, Professor Sinclair. I'd like to show you this picture. We couldn't travel in this region. This is a, a gateway to uh, uh, River uh, Alakananda. There are seven new seven new towns have sequentially emerged. in the bottom of the river alakananda and these are creating as a as a say urban heat affecting the local climate so water said management water said management going on and with now training the the coming research scholar visiting the places in the ecological restoration of the dudha toli region uttarakhand and the chamoli region uttarakhand almora region where large scale public participation awareness is going on in ecological restoration so with these words i would like to thank you sir thank you sir the climate change and, and uh, ecological crisis and the ecological restoration thank you so much so uh dr pandey um yeah. at the end, at the end you were uh sharing many ideas about um local initiatives for increasing biodiversity um yeah so which one of those resonates the most with you and uh, your screen is still sharing for some reason Okay, I'm going to close. Yeah. Thank you. It's fine. Yeah. So, uh, yes, yeah, so there uh of the uh after the number of villages in uh, Uttarakhand particularly uh have have become ghost villages. So now government of the union government as well as the state government or now have created the campaign now come back to the village chalo apno desh chalo apno gaon so now come back to the village so in this program a number of initiatives and particularly the water said management now emerging as a spring said management in uttarakhand himachal pradesh so through the spring said management rejuvenating the dry springs supporting the supply of water to the local community and so that local community may engage again back to their agriculture horticulture and animal husbandry 
So through this ecological restoration, livelihood now coming back to these villages. Right. Thank you. A quick question for Dr. Pandey. Yeah, I have uh, one small comment and one question. And, Sir. Uh, but in fact, no question. In, uh, there are comments and uh, some minor solution. See, I think it's very interesting work because the Himalaya is a lifeline of India and uh, it has a major role to play I mean, in the sustainability of Indian uh, uh, India, let me be very frank. And it's a very good, very important area to work and your work is going to be, I think, will make a difference in sustainability of those areas. I'm very confident and very important issue. See, what uh, Professor Pandey has raised, very interesting uh, question and uh, which has emerged uh, both at the national level and at the global level, the water refugees. Because yeah. the uh, migrants, uh, because of water, Okay, and that is playing a very significant role in infecting the demography and economics and sociology of many other cities. So, say so these water migrants, I mean, in last two decades, it, ha it has happened in very dramatically in, uh, in India. And uh, there are many countries. Uh, I remember there was a call from Europe on water migrants where, I mean, so I think this, this water, mi the issue of mi water migrants and is, is very important, which he has highlighted. And I'm sure some of the ideas which I mean, there are different your experts and you give that will also make a difference that how we can really address those areas. You know, what are migrants? Another small uh, suggestion, I mean, uh, although I'm sure that uh, Professor Pandey is already considering it, we should uh, also emphasize on adapting the conservation-based income. Right. Because, right. Yeah, yeah. because ultimately th those communities who are relying directly on those natural resources and if they're lost because of many in developmental activities or because of change in land use, they should get uh, conservation-based income, which is considered yeah. at the global level now that, that we must go for, because ultimately uh, those communities should have some incentive. And uh, such kind of um, conservation-based income has played a very significant role in, in uh, other in, uh, conservation of Himalayan biodiversity, like in, uh, you know, uh, so many snow, snow leopard and so on in India. So that has played a significant role. I'm sure that your work will also consider and uh, uh, what do you say, feeling that for conservation-based income for those communities. And thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, a really a nice uh, observation, sir. And uh, this conservation, uh, definitely this income, this kind of initiative is now definitely the need of the time. So, yeah, thank you, sir. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, share a few thoughts uh, from my side, um, just to, to wrap things up here in the last few minutes that we have. I, I don't have to worry about you all going to take chai because um, you're not all in the same building and you can't all go off and have chai. Uh, so I have you captive for a few more minutes. Yes, you have to have your chai at your desk. Um, so what I want to do, uh, share. Um, there we go. Um, what I wanted to share with you is some work that uh, I've been doing for a few years now and most recently uh, with I've been working with my colleague Rajiv Biswal whose name you see here. Unfortunately you don't see his face. He hasn't been able to log into the system for some reason. He is watching the YouTube channel though, so he can uh, hear what's going on. Um, so I guess a, a little bit different from the talks we had have had so far, my, my sort of entry point um, is, is local to start with. We were talking about, uh, you know, how to, about biodiversity and, and uh, moving you know, sort of from national and international to local levels. Um, what, what we've been working on in this research is the local level. And I also work with policy instruments. So for me, one of the most important policy instruments for sustainability is environmental assessment um, because it's one of the few legislated uh, uh, processes throughout that, that's ubiquitous, basically. It's practiced in over 150 countries around the world. So um, uh, I find opportunities within assessment for activating change. And 
this research that we've been doing is related to um, uh, community-based environmental assessment. We pulled this, these two headlines out of, uh, out of the Times of, of India and the Hindustan Times. Um, so, you know, environmental assessment is, is in the news a lot. You don't have to look very far. If you did a Google search of our newspapers from the last few days, you'd find articles on EIA. Um, mainly because um, many of the projects that, that are considered through assessment processes are controversial. Um, and in many cases, that's because of their impacts on biodiversity. Our focus, uh, my colleague Harry Spalling and I have been working on community-based environmental assessment. So this is local level assessment where um, the thousands and thousands and thousands of small projects that take place around the world every day that, that impact biodiversity are considered in a, mo a more holistic way, in a way that um, hopefully sustainability is actually actioned. And it's assessment by the people, for the people. So um, with the help of a facilitator, in this case, the cases that I'm going to talk about, Rajib was the facilitator. Uh, local communities carry out their own environmental assessments. And um, I'll talk a little bit about what happens through, through those, through those community-based assessments. Um, the work that Rajib did was he's, he picked up some of these ideas um, that, that my colleagues, Bob Gibson and Meinhard Doyle and I have been talking about, about next generation environmental assessment. So next generation environmental assessment is, as the name suggests, um, it, it takes us beyond the sort of environmental assessment we're practicing now um, and incorporates new thinking such as gender-based analysis and, and uh, those sorts of issues. Um, we have 14 components of next generation assessment. I'm not gonna try to tell you all of those, um, but I'm happy to share papers if people are interested. Um, but what Rajib did in his work um, was tried to focus on th three areas um, that would bring community-based environmental assessment into the next generation. So he focused on people's perception of sustainability, meaningful participation and follow-up and monitoring. And he did all that when thinking, while thinking about learning and how learning might occur within communities about issues like sustainability and biodiversity. Um, Rajiv did his, his research in Kenya. Uh, Harry Spalling and I have had projects in Kenya for, um, I guess, 15 or more years now. Um, many of them related to water and uh, many of the small projects that are are uh, undertaken for community-based assessment are, are water projects because as we've just heard from the last speakers and the conversation afterwards, um, water is, is so important to every, every community and every country and it's scarce everywhere, perhaps except here in Canada. Um, so uh, yeah, two water projects, two case studies that, that Rajib did in, in uh, Kenya, um, trying to implement next generation sustainability assessment. And without going into a huge amount of detail because of time, uh, what Rajib did was he um, implemented next generation assessment and he did it in the way that's um, displayed on your screen right now. So he did pre, what he called pre, community-based environmental assessment, where he went into the community um, to understand local context and needs, to build trust, to start thinking about sustainability and what people started to, to think about sustainability. Then he actually did the CBEA, which had similar steps to um, uh, what EA has, with, you know, screening, scoping, impact mitigation, and creating an assessment plan. And then um, working on, on the outcomes. And through all the CBEA portion, 
he had a focus on those four areas that, that uh, I mentioned at the outset. So sustainability, meaningful participation, follow-up and learning. Um, so what we just wanted to focus on here was obviously not everything he did because we don't have time. And that is Rajib in that picture, um, standing talking. So I'm sorry you can't meet him on the screen right now, but you could at least see him. Um, and Rajib worked very hard in these two communities uh, I, for, um, I think he was there five months at least in, in Kenya doing these projects. And what I'm just offering here, what we are just offering here is um, some of the most valued ecosystem components that the local people talked about that they wanted considered as part of the assessment process. And this was, uh, these were identified during sc the screening process. So um, ecosystem components like water and soil, of course, their own health and their own livelihoods were the, the foremost and important components that were identified. Um, but, but as the, and it's too bad Rajib isn't with us because he actually did the work so he could offer the color commentary of what people said that I am sorry I can't do because I expected him to be here to offer this part of the presentation. Um, but uh, maybe if you have questions, he can text me some answers as we're, as we're talking, but um, he, as, as they went through the impact portions, the, so the projects were to, to build um, new, new water, uh, no water dams, new water facilities, um, what the impact was going to be on the local e ecosystems. And as he started to do that, then some of the, the impacts on uh, biodiversity and how biodiversity might be protected started to come to the fore locally as well as people's concerns about sustainability. Um, in, the, in the end, in terms of some of the outcomes, in one of the lenses that Rashid was using was a social learning lens. We've been doing a lot of work on social learning as part of, of um, many of the resources management types of projects and activities we undertake. Um, so sustainability, um, people did define sustainability locally. He was able to define sustainability locally. Obviously, just like us, it means different things to different people, but they were able to come up with a comprehensive term for sustainability that they could implement. Um, and then in terms of protection of lo local biodiversity as part of the environmental management plan for the project, uh, three areas that Rajib would have talked about and provided you more information on related to con conservation of the water channel and the water in the channel, conservation of butterflies in the area, and soil conservation. Um, and these were all local initiatives to be part of the project. Um, and lastly, just some acknowledgements from some of the folks that were involved. Um, who included uh, the National Environmental Management Authority, who we've also been working with in Kenya uh, in relation to community-based environmental assessment. So I'll stop there. I didn't go too long, I don't think. I'm sorry about that if I did. Um, and I will uh, just... Um, Shut that down and then I can see my screen. And if you have a question that I can't um, answer, maybe Rajib, I know he's listening, will quickly offer an answer. Um, we've been doing this work in, in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, so the most recent was Rajib's work in, in that I've just presented. But as I said, we've been doing different projects for about 15 years and Harry even before that. So yeah, any questions people might have? Tonight, uh, Professor uh, John Sinclair has a wonderful, uh, uh, some uh, uh, pictures uh, bringing us back to the last 25 years back in the Kulu Valley. 
Yes. So we had a, a community meeting in Gosal village, if you remember, with Meru. Yes. Merchan, Gosal village. So uh, do you experience uh, what kind of differences in the community-based environmental conservation in the Kenya and uh, in Kulu Valley, India? Yeah, so I can't speak exactly to the case study that Rajiv did because um, I wasn't there with him, uh, but I was there for other case studies that we did in Kenya, and I think they were probably pretty much the same. Um, I think the main difference is from my perspective, as people were more engaged in, in Africa. So the local okay. people, as you saw, there were many local people in those images that came to the meetings that Rajib uh, held and they weren't paid to attend. They, they came to participate. They wanted the water project to be built, right? They, mm -hmm. they obviously had a goal. Um, okay. So, and it is sort of hard to compare uh, because some of the things we did in in India, there was no, like we weren't we weren't um, we weren't there to undertake a particular project for the community. We were there to discuss community needs. In this yeah. case, it was a pro project uh, the community had already developed the need for, and okay. wanted to, and yeah. had the and had the funding to build, but they. Um, one thing I didn't mention is is these these projects did result in official approval at the end um, to build from NEMA from the National uh, um, Environmental Assessment Agency in in uh, in Kenya to actually go ahead and build these projects. Okay, thank you. It's a little bit different. It's May a little different to compare. Yes, uh, Doctor Singh. May I ask? May I ask something? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought it, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. I, I, we can't see you, so I, I, I didn't <laughs> so, <laughs> Please go uh, ahead. So tell me, uh, 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 so th this were some uh, projects for which uh, uh, your colleague and you were doing environmental and social impact assessment studies. Correct. What kind of projects they were for, they for were what both, kind of development? They were yeah. both for they were both water projects. So they were to tap new springs to provide water ah. to the communities. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, they were both water projects. Yes. Okay. Uh, and we okay. can. I'm happy. We can send you. Uh, more information and, and Rajiv could have like we obviously this was a very short version of a a long long papers that we have with the details of each of the the projects like we have all of the details of each of the projects obviously yeah it, it would be interesting anyway I am in fact uh, doing such studies and uh, you know in uh, we are calling uh, them environmental and social impact uh, uh, studies in order to local community to be involved, right? Um, because in Europe there, are, you know, there are um, European leg legislation for pre preparing such studies, but uh, in every country in Europe they are doing environmental impact assessment studies. But if you are depending from uh, from some banks to be financed your project, then you should do and social impact assessment studies to be involved into the in environmental impact uh, study in order to get that uh, that financial support by the banks. So that, right. that is quite normal. But any, anyway, it depends by it depends um, by the by the investor. It depends by the project manager who is doing impact, impact assessment study because if he is enough cap capable. Because as you see, I'm ASEA, ASEA impact assessment uh, uh, and strategic impact assessment uh, legal expert. So that's why I'm interested about uh, this topic. So it depends who is doing that study. 
not uh, who is uh, some part uh, it depends uh, who is putting the rules but uh, the most yeah. important is who is doing that study so yeah yeah so i, I agree with you fully and in in this case um the study so um as you've pointed out uh in kenya like like you were just mentioning kenya has has um formal assessment laws and they applied in this case um but typically what would have happened is the community would have hired a consultant that just came in and did a, a um, drive-by assessment um, and provided the paperwork for, for NEMA and NEMA would approve the project. So what, we're, what we were attempt, have been attempting to do in, in these community-based assessments yeah. is more of what you've described. Uh, my colleague, Harry Spalling is a certified uh, environmental assessment practitioner in Kenya. Uh, but in this case, Rajib worked with a certified environmental assessment practitioner um, who, we, who we didn't know until Rajib went there. And um, uh, um, he, he was a consultant that we, that, that agreed to do um, the assessment in the way that we were proposing uh, but wasn't willing to take on any extra work for himself. So it was up to us. So that's just underscoring your point that it really does depend on who's doing the assessment. But the idea of doing it was to, to, for it to be an example to the government of Kenya, uh, to NEMA, of what they could do, what they could require. Um, so they could make assessments more like what you've described. Yes. Professor John, um, uh, sorry. sorry. No, go ahead. Ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's really interesting. And uh, I'm, please excuse me if I ask any irrelevant question because I'm new to this field. So, <laughs> so I had a friend of mine who was uh, running an NGO uh, in Burkina Faso, uh, which is also one of the African countries. They have like uh, water issues. Um, yep. um, so what they found. Um, that there was some kind of uh, parasitic infection in the uh, you know water so the water resources were there but you know people uh, those who were consuming that water they had uh, some serious illness and consequences physiological consequences so that ngo they are working on developing the water quality because they you know based on the census they learn like you know there is some kind of illness, you know, occurring because of that uh, water quality, bad water quality of, you know, that local area. And also, uh, I think it's a cultural thing that women used to carry water, you know, so the men, they don't, you know, do all the household stuff. So they build a rolling drum kind of thing. And you might have seen pictures, you know, that the African women, they use the carry baby at the back and then they use that rolling drum to, you know, carry water. So, um, so my, my question is, sorry, it's, it, it, I elaborated it too much. So my question is, it's incredible that you have like 15 years data, if I'm correct. You have been studying Tanzania and Kenya since 15 years. Actually, it may even be more than that, but yeah. Um, That's it has really incredible. You, know, that you, you have developed a system to like address several issues, you know, and address several questions there. So my question is, did you find any trend in uh how the water quality water resources have changed across the period and have you find any correlation with the development uh with sustainability you know development with industrial development and you know how the uh, livelihood of people changing over there you know and related to water quality and resources right so um it's highly variable and, and as, as you might expect. So in this case, one of the projects was to build another water tank to store water for irrigation. Mm -hmm. um, in another project, one of the previous projects that we worked on, the water, the project was to build a new pipeline from a spring um, to the community. Uh, but so, so, in all cases, the water was going to be used for local irrigation as well. Uh, not, not, well, 
uh, not large scale irrigation like you might see in parts of India or here in Canada, but rather like drip irrigation or bucket irrigation. Um, so uh, actually the, the, the quality of the water in the Cassiani project uh, from the spring was very good. Um, the, the, the issue was uh, the sustainability of the source was a bigger issue than the quality of the water. Um, another issue related to the quality of the water was whether the elephant elephants got to the spring and used the spring and uh, defecated in the spring um, while they were there, <laughs> which, which uh, um, changed the quality of the water, obviously. But then the other side of it is that I'll just say quickly, uh, in terms of biodiversity and use, you know, the, in Rajiv's case, they were talking about butterflies and the, and the Kissiani project, that was an issue as well. Uh, but also um, in, in areas of the community that haven't had irrigation, when they start to irrigate, of course, you get more species because of the soil moisture. And one of the species that you, of course, get is mosquitoes and the prevalence of malaria increases um, in, in those communities. So the, that social impact is, and, and managing how um, water is used becomes very important as part of, as part of these projects. I, I think, just, I'll just finish by saying, and I'll just check because I know Rajiv just sent an email, but um, Quantity and availability has been more important in most of the places in, in Kenya that I've been to than, than, than the quality. Okay. Um, yeah, another John. question is based on curiosity. So well, what is the funding source of, you know, the, you working in Kenya? Is it the Kenyan government or like the Canadian government? Uh, Canadian government. So do they also fund for like other countries? Because I know like several uh, Indian states, they have uh, issues and, you know, probably yeah. scientists are looking for collaborations. Sure. Um, so this is part of the work that we did was part of a, a my, my and Harry's research grant. So the work that I've been doing in India and in, in Kenya and Tanzania and in Thailand are all related to my, um, so we have three granting agencies in Canada, SHRC, NSERC, and, and uh, the Medical Research Council. This is the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council that has been funding this research. So that's what um, helped to pay for Rajiv along with uh, his, the scholarships that he got for him to do the work. Thank you. But the community, but the community coming back to the point that, uh, uh, Dr. Bracco made, um, the community paid for the consultant for the, the uh, EA expert, um, and that would have been bank money. Um, but the requirement for the money wasn't from the bank, it was from actually from NEMA, from the government of Kenya, which probably, you know, you could argue that some of their processes are the result of, of what, the, what the banks require. But ultimately, it was NEMA that oversaw the process. Thank you. Yeah, John, thank you very much for a very interesting case study which you have presented. And, uh, and it's a new kind of framework which you have suggested in your, through your research that we must use, uh, I mean, the next generation, what do you say, the assessment program. So since, I mean, although the, your papers are available, I think I'll take advantage of your presence and uh, right now. See, uh, I have a couple of uh, two or three queries too. And, and these queries are not questions, but in fact, I want to learn from you. See, uh, one thing which you mentioned is perception. Okay. And I think that that has, uh, that plays a very significant role in managing the natural resources and even preventing the threat. Because as uh, just a few minutes ago, when uh, Dr. Singh was asking about the invasive species, in one of the studies, what we found is perception, because yeah, I know I want to know how you did the perception analysis. Because invasive species have been integrated in many society. They, I mean, ecologically they are threat, but in society they have been integrated because people, the, you know, the society is, I mean, they, they try to integrate and assimilate and whatever is available. So now the, the perception analysis, what we found is 
in some areas in in this country in the invasive species in certain society they are they have become part of the rituals and many other practices okay so now in now perception has changed now what as an as a student of ecology we see as a threat and we want to educate the people how you know, we should mitigate and control these threats but at the same time now there is a society i mean because it's a major threat when society integrates and accept and they become part of the society so then the perception plays a very significant role so how did you do the perception analysis because then i think that that's very interesting because we want to carry out such kind of perception analysis in for certain natural resources so would you like to make some i mean some suggestions for us sure. so so the first thing i would say is these are very small projects so the amount of research that's that's carried out um is is limited so a typical um EIA consultant expert probably would have done this Rajiv might email me to say differently but in 2 days um we spent many days over months on all of the projects doing the work we did so they're atypical in that way uh having said that we didn't do formal perception studies as you might be thinking about them uh but let me give you an example um you know as as i indicated in the in the slides um of course part of environmental assessment is trying to understand the baseline environment and people's perception of their own environment so um one of the things we learned at the kisiani project is that people's perception of where water came from was not correct so they saw hills in the distance and they thought that that's where the water came from from those hills and that the hills needed to be protected uh so that they would continue to have a source of water in fact the water for the spring uh was in a different watershed their spring uh was in a different watershed than the water from those hills so um yeah i i think you're absolutely right that perception is is very important um um and uh uh rashid just emailed me and said for these small projects it, the experts that he talked to they they do it in one day so they they do the assessment in one day um not in in weeks and weeks like we spent so um uh yeah so we we don't we we even in the work that we did that was more detailed we didn't do like formal perception studies but we did try to get a we did try to get a good sense of what people's understanding of their own environment was and sustainability and biodiversity issues related to that environment so that then they could start to think about the impacts that the project that was proposed might have in their community and this is particularly difficult as as uh Dr. Bracco might um underscore because when people want a project they have trouble thinking about the potential negative consequences of that project um but part of the reason why Rajib looked at learning and why we've looked at learning in other projects is because if if these processes result in community learning then they carry that learning forward uh to the next project and the next project so if they do learn more about their community more about the biodiversity in their community and where water comes from um that can have benefits in the future yeah thank you john and there's another small uh, i mean query on this see since you have done uh, community based natural resource assessment okay so yep. so do you have uh, any comparison because that will be that is very interesting because many times in do, during assessment we don't consider community as a part uh, and we do the we carry out the assessment and then based on the assessment we want community should act okay yep. so here, here you have done community based assessment because that's the framework yep. Yep. so do, do you have some kind of interesting comparison where now in the, of similar problem where you had, you worked on community based assessment in another area where and then the scientist and the ecologist or or other agency social scientists they have done the assessment 
and now they have come out with some kind of recommend and one program failed and your program was successful i mean such kind of interesting i mean so that we some key learning from uh, such kind of comparison which based on your experience yeah so the the only the only thing that um we've been comparing against in 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 this in these examples is the sorts of um uh assessments that have been done for other small projects, which I've sort of already indicated were pretty rudimentary. And yes, there's examples of, of um, many projects uh, where, where that has failed um, because there wasn't a proper assessment done. But let me, let me uh, move to India for a couple of examples. So we've done a lot of work, uh, as as Dr. Pandy knows, in in uh, on small hydro in the high mountain areas, and there is supposed to be uh, um, an assessment of sorts carried out for those projects before they're built, um, and we have reviewed many of those assessments. We haven't actually done our own community-based assessment in India, but we have lots of evidence of. Um, uh, micro hydro projects that have failed in India um, and have looked at the assessments that were done and can point to those as, as part of the reason, at least, um, why those projects failed. Last small query. I mean, I, I, I'll take advantage, I mean, with your permission. See, uh, since uh, these, uh, I mean, framework I mean, are going to be very useful for management, so in, in your case studies, in that uh, the, the psychological barriers on land use, okay, and how the land use is going to affect. And uh, so did, did you find some kind of psychological barriers, which you, uh, I mean, uh, so that the community can really accept some of these changes and uh, they act on uh, more, what do you say, ecologically sound manner? So did you find some kind of, I mean, challenges on breaking those psychological barriers? Um, yeah, I, it's an interesting question for sure. And I'm trying to think, you know, in relation to the Kissiani case, you know, where people had perceptions of how things functioned in the natural system that were incorrect. Um, but I, you know, I don't, um, the biggest things regarding land use in, in Africa, I guess, in, in some respects, relate to parts of India and Kenya, at least in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, there's so many farmers, right? So any innovation in farming, um, the more land that's brought in production, and that's why there's more irrigation, right? To bring more land into production. So, you know, really the, 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 the issue is from, from the issue that we're talking about, biodiversity is bringing more land into agriculture and how sustainable that is. Um, uh, despite the need to feed a growing population. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't think of, you know, obviously other than these are community development projects all the projects that we looked at and, and the sorts of projects that community-based assessment focuses on are community-based development projects. Um, so, you know, a big challenge is thinking about whether those development projects are sustainable or not. Um, and, and philosophically, you know, like psychologically, the community will want those development projects. Uh, but the experts may say, well, they, they, they don't make sense. Um, and I think, I think um, you know, part of the, the change and Rajiv just emailed me and he said one of the things that uh, he said definitely is challenging and in response to your question. And then he said um, uh, that as the community started to better understand their own collective perception of sustainability, it made a difference. Thank you, John. Thank you very much.
No, thank you for the questions. Uh, there, it's great to actually. I I I haven't um, done any online meetings since that we all went to Zoom. The conferences I was supposed to go to were canceled. One of them did not go online. One of them did, and I chose not to join. Uh, but when I got the invite to do this, I thought I would join, and it's uh, it's actually great to interact with all of you and hear the questions and. Uh, uh, try to respond to the questions and we're all in different places um, and uh, have done work in, in different areas where um, we've interacted with people from different cultures and backgrounds and and uh, that that's what I think makes biodiversity conservation so challenging right um, and we all have different needs uh, for some people the need is just finding having food to eat at the end of the day. Um, so I know we're, we're well over uh, Dr. Singh. So um, I, I, we're, yeah, we're sort of 30, sort of the other Dr. Singh, we're sort of 30 minutes uh, um, over time. Uh, that's not bad in, in the Indian context in my experience, but um, maybe not so great when it's the start of the day and you probably have another session starting right now. So um, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to thank all of the speakers. I hope that you enjoyed the session too. I know it's late for Devraj as well. I don't know what-, what uh, It's 12.30 in the morning, so well. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you might be an hour ahead of me. I'm, on, I'm only yeah, at 11. You're in Chicago time zone, I guess. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm on Eastern time zone. Well, that's fine. <laughs> I'm used um, to it. We have um, uh, many students now joining us because they can't get here via Zoom. So we have students in India and Bangladesh that are, you know, the afternoon classes are in the middle of the night for them. So I guess this is payback for me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's what my research is about, you know, studying circadian system along with seasonal yes. system. Yes, yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure talking to everyone. I really enjoyed yeah. this session. One minute, one minute, one minute, sir. Uh, I'm audible, sir? Yes, yeah, yes, I, Ramar, sir. Yeah, yeah I was... Okay. Was, uh, sir, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor John Sinclair and Professor Bronco, Professor Radisham, uh, Professor Dr. B. S. B. W. Pandey, sir, and Dr. Devras, sir. Thank you, uh, everyone, to join the meet and talk about the perspective of Biogeography and Biodiversity Commission. A very good session. Thank for giving us your valuable time and to contribute in this discussions meet on Biogeography Biodiversity Commissions. We are more than thankful that you attend our event. We hope you enjoy and experience a lot. Uh, looking forward to meeting uh, you all again next time. I hope so. We will meet very soon yeah. physically also. Thank you. Thank many, you so much. Many, many congratulations, Dr. Bhavarsha. Sir, thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, apart, from, apart from the discussion, we had a guest appearance of Professor R.B. Singh, sir, our guru. Yes, sir. Yes. And uh, also, that, uh, one other colleague from the Al Singh College, Dr. Abhashankar Prasad, and uh, two research scholars who are working on the mountain biodiversity. Uh, they, have, they have also joined Sambhavna Chaudhary and Rachana Rani Sharma. So, and I hope they have also registered themselves for this event. And uh, thank you so much for a great session. It was a pleasure meeting everybody. Um, yeah, same here. Same here. And I hope I hope to uh, uh, visit your institution, your your department when next time I'm in Delhi. Uh, Dr. Sharma. Most welcome. We'll wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll wait. Uh, in fact, uh, I would like to share some of our ideas and uh, take your comments. And similarly, uh, Devraj, I think, uh, sure. um, let's see, I mean, how we can uh, further interact and learn from each other of and uh, resolve some of the local problems for uh, sustainability. Yeah, of let's course. see. Your, your questions were very uh, challenging. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, it well, was well, learning, learning experience listening to all of you. And in fact, I got many insights. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, have a good day. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, sir. And good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night.
Good. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Have a great, uh, happy new year, everyone. I hope 2021 is very good to everybody. Hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same to you. Same to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good night, Devraj. See you also. <laughs>